uh, primitive uh, weather forecasting or meteorology, aidless navigation, it just never ends, right? Of all of these, I started off with these two without even knowing it. Tracking and awareness and plant knowledge. And because I started out with it, I have a bias towards them. So it's not an apology, it's a warning. You're going to hear a lot of pro-tracking, pro-plant knowledge as means to break through certain plateaus that are trendy or are the majority of people's uh, level of competency and skill sets. And I can give you examples because I live in that space of that bias, right? The idea of going outside to check the mail is obsolete when you can see that the postal truck came by two hours ago or didn't come by since yesterday before it rained. I used to joke that my kids could run away from home, but I, I could track them down. And just three days ago, or before I got here, three days before we got here, I tracked down one of my head instructors because he wanted to go out and try some uh, ninja tree jumping in the morning when I needed to have a meeting with him, and he was two and a half miles away. And it's not because of any supernatural abilities, it's just dirt time. It's just the hunger to want to be able to find that next thing in track. How many of you had that hunger for learning how to read? Yeah. When you're hungry, though, when you're really hungry, it amps it, right? So if you could learn how to read lifeless scribble on pages, you could learn how to read meaningful dents in the ground for security, to feed your family, to stay out of trouble, to avoid detect, whatever, all right? And to me, that's real life, applicable, everyday, cool stuff, all right? So I'm going to be biased with tracking. With the plant knowledge, the idea that you could know every single edible, medicinal, utilitarian use of all of the trees, shrubs, vines, lianas, herbaceous plants, whether they're annuals, biannuals, when those things are harvestable, how to put them by for winter, how to rent them for cordage from strong enough for your bow, how to make your bow, all of those things to deal with plants, again, a bias that that plant knowledge separates the John Rambo that I was and want to be when I was 21, I wanted to be so like him, right? versus that native who didn't have to have any gear but scared the poop out of this amazing individual yesterday by making animal noise and never got seen. I want that person's skills with modern gear combined. Right? So my walk is about trying to find the best practices between our ancestors of 2,000 years ago, 500 years ago, my grandparents who went through the Great Depression, so I can hand off what may be the most viable collection of those skills to the unborn generations of my children's children. That's pretty much where I'm coming from with this. So if you're comfortable with that bias, then hopefully you'll enjoy what we're about to present here. Um, real quick, if this whole idea of individual skill development is our first phase. I alluded to, you, to that to you before. When we use the, the compass roads or the cardinal directions, to, to place that in the east where the sun rises, right? It's about enlightenment. The sun rises up, the birds are singing, it's a great time to be out, you get excited for the new day. If you're in a healthy paradigm, you're coming from a place of rare to go. Hard charge, right? It's a term that's used, I like that word, hard charge. Mickey Grossman is all about hard charge, holy mackerel, man. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Right? Then we get to the next phase. Now, this archetype works whether we're in uh, survival, it works in uh, a trade, you get really excited about this new skill set, and you end up burning holes in your carpet practicing it, right, with bow drill or hand drill. Or the electronics trade, or lock smithing, okay, to be PC, right? You get really excited and you get embarrassed because you're kind of locked up, or you can't get the in the can into the little group. But all of these things are leading to a place where now you want to share with your friends and peer mentoring starts to occur. And this is what this is like one of the many magical pieces of this event is just you sit down at a table long enough, someone else is going to sit down right next to you and you're going to start sharing skills. You're going to start sharing stories and experiences. And from that comes personal growth. Because even if you're the person sharing the skill, you have to retell it which means it goes through all of your wiring system, brings up the most valuable parts of those memories and experiences, and it hardwires it into your body better. You become more effective at what you do by sharing what you do. It's almost like we've had some evolutionary processes toward that end. 
And whether or not we did, it works, so I'm using it because the results are pretty valid. And then we call that in the southeast peer mentoring. If you're a tracker, that means your peer mentors are the critters that are challenging you, right? If you want to get all esoteric and, and crunchy about it, your enemies are your best friends because they're the ones that challenge you the most, as long as you live to see another day throughout your, your conflict with them, right? Your sparring partners, the person you're in direct competition with during that shooting match. You know, I, love the, I love these competitions, the Ironman competitions, because there are really no losers if you learn from it so that the next time you're sharper and better. And by doing that, it may sound arrogant at first, your hunger to be sharper and to be better drives everybody else around you to do the same. It's the predator-prey relationship taken to the highest order. If the bad guys were all stupid buffoons, the cops would have big giant donut bellies never get out of the car, it would just be a mess, right? We have deer and moose in Maine that every time they blink, they think it's a new day because they're not hunted. There's places where they're not allowed to be hunted. And so people on bikes hit them. Yeah, mountain bikes hit deer and they break their, people break their arms, the deer walk away confused. There's no pressure to push your skill. So when we say convenience kills, I mean, that's the most dramatic example of convenience kills right there. Could you imagine if we didn't have a hunger in our lives or a need to get off the couch and all we did all day was press buttons to change other people's versions of reality and eat off a feed bag steeped in powdered cheese? Not that that would ever happen, but before you knew it, you'd have a whole new subspecies of humanity, homo sapien domestico fragilis, right? It would be a monoculture of zombies. There'd be all this underlying, you know, our wild mind doesn't go away. It's been genetically evolving for a long time, okay? But there are these weird feelings of maybe there should be some kind of apocalypse with these zombies. Not that that would ever happen. <coughs> what happens after peer mentoring? It, it, it increases peristalsis. It's a mild astringent to all of your filtering organs. And it's a food. It's also a fiber. It's a really strong cordial. And I can go down this whole list, but these are all very important. The asterisk means that we have a seasonal foraging regimen. Our community waits with anticipation for the sap to flow, to get the syrup, or the sap that we boil down into syrup and sugar for the maples, right? We don't have enough big birches in our area to support birch syrup. But if we did, we'd have, a, we'd have an extended season. It's like black powder and normal rifle season. You know, if you can do black powder and normal rifle season, you get more deer. Same with the, the sap flow. The suitcase next to each of these means some people have baggage around them. Folks, don't plant Japanese knotweed if you don't have any. Please, you'll never get rid of it. Okay? There's videos on YouTube where they put pavement over Japanese knotweed in England, or concrete slab, and it cracked the concrete slab coming up. That's just horrifying, right? However, if you do find some, process it all on site. I take two buckets, a rinse bucket and a gather bucket. Cut it all up, rinse off what, I, what, what I'm gonna use, put it in my gather bucket, dump the rinse water on site. It's already out there. For eight years, we've had Five or six classes, eight to 12 people in each class going out and ravaging that Japanese knotweed. It hasn't increased in size in that field in that time. But when we first moved in, there was maybe 12 little Japanese, they look like bamboo, right? 12 little plants in the corner of the field, and we didn't do anything with them. We just noted they were there, and suddenly, now it's about a third the size of this, this uh, little, whatever, pavilion, right? Note that we've divided this into seasons. If you're really interested in doing this right, get one of those big desk calendars and put it on the wall. A computer isn't going to do it. you got to have your, your, your muscle memory involved here. And when you see things happening, oh, snapping turtles are laying their eggs right down. Even if it doesn't mean, set, make any sense to you. Groundhog roadkill season. All right, I'll write it. There's two of them, by the way. All right? Groundhog, to me, is one of my... It's one, favorite small mammal meat. I think it tastes as good as venison. Think about what they're eating. Right? 
like you said, right? If it's eating everything out of my garden, I'm going to eat it. And it's delicious. And you don't have to boil it twice like some of the raccoons you get from the kind of pizza places. But those are the ones you save the fat because it may, it's just as good as bear fat. Raccoon fat is so good on a bow. Anyone here make bows? Right? You ever use raccoon fat instead of bear? It's amazing. It makes great candles and soap. Okay? So what we're looking for are larders. And you know what? It's all free. It's all free. And you don't have to weed it. You don't have to mulch it. It takes minimal effort. How many of you are in a garden feeding mosquitoes and black flies and worrying about critters munching on your radishes and lettuce? I am. Right? But that's just a small ratio of the overall food larders on the landscape. Any questions on this? Nothing? I have yes. One. I don't know how much burdock roots would be in Virginia. I know in the South there was an article I read about eight years ago. There was a big problem with wild turnip. Is that what it is? The yellow causes phytophotodermatitis. Hogweed. Hogweed. Parsnip, thank you. Right? And we had some show up. It never got a hold because we ate it all before it got to blossom. You know, I researched it and thought, man, that's a food larder. If I were down there, I'd be learning, I'd be learning how to harvest it without dying. Apparently, it won't hurt you until it starts to blossom, and then the plant releases those phytochemicals to protect itself primarily from boll weevils. Here's the cool part. You think plants are stupid, right? Boll weevil comes along, sticks its proboscis into this juicy plant. Everything is fine. Its belly is full. The clouds break. The sun comes out, and it explodes. <laughs> Come on, how cool is that? <laughs> We don't explode. We just get sausage-shaped blisters that are painful and last for months sometimes. But only to protect itself from predation when it starts to create its seed. So as long as the flowers aren't out, you can harvest it in relative safety. To be safer, overcast day, long sleeve shirt. When you get home, shower. You're good. We don't need to deeply fear plants. There are a few that can kill you. There's a bunch of them down on the water's edge. You're gonna, uh, we're going to run into them when we do the plant class tomorrow. Right? That's right, water hemlock is one of the few. Out of over 2,000 plants in any biome, Florida has like 10 times that much, but in any biome there's at least 2,000 native plants. There's probably only 20 or less that can kill you. And of those 20 or less, there's probably 8 or less that actually don't taste so bad as they do it. The rest are going to cause severe burning, blistering, vomiting, until you get the dose that finally kills you. You really gotta work at it. Nature has a way of calling out those that smell you. Right? So, I don't know. I don't have anything left unless you're not. I mean, I, I got some. Uh, if you wanted to plant some plants, what I do is I, I look for the trees. In my area, hemlocks indicate wet soil. So the plants that like wet soil, like pickerel weed, uh, Indian cucumber, I'm going to plant those, right? Red and oak and weeds are about well-drained soils. We plant sweet fern. Sweet fern is high in tannins, and unlike oak, is available from early spring through the late summer while we're waiting for those acorns to drop. And tannins, the tannic acid washes we use on our full survival trips or to wash our feet after they've been punctured, are strong. They help prevent infections and they accelerate the healing process. Everything from sunburn to loose gums to, uh, what's that, when you get the rash under your armpits, uh, invitego or whatever it is, all of those common in the field hygiene issues. Folks, I, I must be doing something wrong. Maybe it's because I'm not jumping out of aircraft or sucking on elephant poop or something, but the biggest <laughs> problems in the woods that we're running into are hygiene related. And there's no dramatic music, it's just Hershey squirts and vine. <laughs> So no tannic acid washes. Don't be a vector. Little things like make a, make a pine bark basket to hold your tannin water in and place it near your latrine. 
and then do a second one so that you have to wash up before you enter the food prep area and keep your shelters far enough away that if a bear gets interested, they're not going to be licking the peanut butter off your lips when you're trapping your debris hut. <laughs> It'd be like, like an ice cream cone all wrapped up. <laughs> you know, it's usually hygiene that gets you. I know, big spooky woods myth, busted. Right? So look at the trees, what's growing underneath them, and then if you can find a useful plant, and there's a lot of them, thin them out, you don't need to wipe them out, thin out about a third, bring that third back to your yard, and plant them in similar areas. Some of them are going to fail. But guess what? Now you know. Right? But a lot of them are going to stick. Okay? Bone set, we use for flus. And I know that sounds like a myth. There's no such thing as a cure for a flu. But when someone starts to cough or get a sniffle, we drink bone set, it's bitter. Absolutely. It is bitter. It works. We had it, yeah? It works. It last year. It never seems to evolve past that initial stage, just it? Doesn't work. <laughs> And then I want to end on one last thing. Um, yeah, there's a, I can go into this in this question. The last thing I want to share is I'm hearing a lot about these plants and they're being put on pedestals as the next great cure-all. Um, American ginseng almost disappeared because of this, right? And then sometimes they become villains because the pharmaceutical companies feel intimidated, like sarsaparilla and sassafras were villainized. Well, it causes cancer. Actually, it doesn't. What causes cancer is when you extract and isolate some of the alkaloids that are trace elements in a whole suite of phytochemicals, and then you amp them and superdose them to rats, and then they're surprised that there's tumors. You would have to eat five bales of sarsaparilla to get sick, and that's over a period of five or six years. Comfrey is another one. There's been one case of suspected maybe comfrey issue where a woman in California, I know, go figure, got obsessed with comfrey and that's all she ate for six years and then she had a she had a liver issue. So now we hear warnings about eating too much. You know what? I'm gonna get a warning out there. Did you know if you have too much water you could die? They call it drowning. <laughs> right? And your body, this is gonna come as a shock, has this amazing mechanism. Now it's cloudy. I'm gonna give you why in a minute. Your body has an amazing mechanism called cravings that help to determine what nutrients you're deficient in. And it also has this feeling of not wanting to eat anymore, not being full. That's actually a symptom of eating too much nutrient poor material until your stomach is so distended you can't fit anymore. That's different. When we eat wild foods, it's a shift into I just don't feel like eating anymore. Anyone ever feel the difference between the Roy Rogers salad bar full and you make a nice wild salad and you eat like six bites and you're done. Right? So we have these built-in mechanisms. And I can share an example that you might have had a, re a hand in. When you were a kid, raise your hand if you went and you saw this shrub, like a needle leaf shrub. It had little red berries that looked like olives. They had little, like, like a cord olive. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. Who's it called? Not me, you. No, yeah, they're you. Y-E-W, right? Those berries are juicy, they don't smell bad. How many of you as a kid used to smush them or throw them at each other? Huh, no one ate them. You know how I know? Because you'd be dead. But you, as a kid, how many of you picked wild onion or scallions out of the ground and ate them? Yeah, right? Something's in there. I don't know how it works, and I don't know how to control or replicate it. But I just know that if we get called out to track an adult, and it's past three days, Chances are we're going to have to do a recovery. We get called out to track a kid that's not an abduction or a crime. Chances are we're going to find that kid squirrely and bright eyed, hidden underneath a fallen log with all kinds of oak leaves all over them, <laughs> hiding on the rescuers. Right? What happened? Why did we lose it? And that goes back to our job, the job security. We don't have to lose it. Right? Any questions? Because I think I'm about done. Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. Frequency and dosage. If I were to eat a bowl full of dandelion, like I would eat a bowl full of choco cocoa crispies, I'd probably vomit the, the dandelion up. And if I were from Homer Simpsonville, I attribute it to me being allergic to dandelion. Well, first of all, allergies don't work that way. 
But if I ate a whole bottle of one-a-day vitamins, I'd still vomit them up. Okay. So what we're dealing with then is a body that's conditioning itself to be chronically malnutrition and adjusting by not growing our jaws in utero enough that we could have enough room for our wisdom teeth. And then dealing with expensive health care and, and poor food as if they were best partners in a money-making scheme. Not that that would ever happen intentionally. Because <laughs> right, uh, I have to believe that all human beings are good. It's just that for me, convenience kills. You know? And so, if we can get off our, that, that couch magnet, man, whew, it's hard sometimes. It's hard. But getting out there and doing it is so rewarding. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. A lot of people are afraid of the stems. Everything is edible in dandelion. The stems have a, a latex-based sap. It's common also in milkweed, the Asclepius group. Um, so if you want to avoid the stems, there's a minor risk that if you ate maybe 30 to 50 dandelion stems, you could experience severe gastrointestinal distress until you bleh, and then you're done. All right? Had that happen with milkweed, not to me unfortunately, because I wanted to see how it felt, to one of my instructors at the time. We were, uh, we were in a place that's all they had was wild leeks and milkweed. And after five days of eating nothing but milkweed, he got sick. He didn't like onions. Well, oh, I, t I ate the leeks. I took a leak. <laughs> Every day, because they, they were so plentiful. It's just he, he didn't like onions, so that's all he ate was milkweed, and then he got sick. Right? The chart under this thing. Oh, that blew over. Um, this is how to process any non native, aggressive species or invasive species so that you don't spread. Right? Come up with your own protocols. You don't want a weed you can't get rid of, no matter how powerfully medicinal it is, if it wipes out everything else you're trying to cultivate on your land. There is, there, it's important to be diverse and to, and to have vibrant health, whether it's the soils or the plants or the mycelium and the fungal matter that grow in there, you know, turkey tail mushrooms, chaga, all of that. Um, and, and all of that supports your meat, right? A lot of people just like meat. Well, if you want meat, you better have plants. And since you're going to have to have plants anyway, they might as well be really useful ones. Yeah. Uh, I'm diabetic. What's the big deal with diabetic? It's a nutrient that doesn't, isn't steep in simple sugars or simple carbs. So you, your body can assimilate the nutrients without having to suffer through sugar imbalances. Okay? And there's hypo and hyperglycemia, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, Beyond that understanding, I'm pretty ignorant with uh, diabetes, except that I have two relatives who grow sunchokes, grew some artichoke, and they use them as a large part of their summer forage to help balance out their issues with their sugar in their blood. Okay. But I want diabetes, um, there's all of these um, nutrition-related deficiency diseases. If you start eating wild foraged foods, you'll find at least from what I've seen on our landscape over the last few decades, a lot of people start commenting on how it's amazing that their symptoms have either completely abated or that they've minimized, right? Not gone away, but minimized. 